breakfast puppies? Welcome to Have Movies Will Game, the only podcast on the globe where we take you, our friendly listener, through the best and worst movies of yesterday and today, and then discuss ways that you can play them at your gaming table. In every episode, our intrepid hosts, Matthew, Dusty, and Nathaniel, will filibuster fondly over facts and feelings of your favorite films, and then get to the glorious gaming goodness, giving game masters great gimmicks on generating golden genius. Have Movies Will Game, brought to you through the electronic wonder of the internet. Now, let's start the show! went to see an episode of wait wait don't tell me get recorded okay and there was a bit where the host and all of the comedians and the the special guest did this riff on dick cheney okay and, <laughs> and peter awesome. sagal was like I, laugh it up now this is never making it to air <laughs> speaking of things that are going to make it sure. to air you're listening to half movies will game uh, and i'm dusty and i'm nathaniel we don't have a matthew today but we do have a special guest here in the house with us hi i'm jerome now, Jerome, Hi, Jerome, you are an old friend of mine for a while now, and yeah. you've been listening to us, I think, since the beginning. I yeah. yeah, I remember you asked me for notes about the first four episodes. So. Yeah, before we launched, I remember thinking, I need I need people that don't suck to, <laughs> to listen to this, and, tell and you me. couldn't find anybody, so he asked me. So he asked you, uh, well done, well, well done, you're doing very well. <laughs> But Jerome, you're also somebody that I know is very into a very uh, specific game system, which we're going to talk about later. Okay, yeah. And I don't want to give anything away, but uh, you've been telling us, uh, dear listener, if you have listened to any of our prior episodes where we talk about game suggestions and Jerome's name is mentioned, you probably know what game that's going to be. <laughs> probably. <laughs> it's probably focuses it's on not, the narrative. It's, it's not Matthew's yeah. favorite of Palladium, so it's not that. <laughs> there could be a Palladium version. There, uh, you know what? You know? Every episode, I'm like... When when are they bringing out Palladium? When are they bringing out Palladium? When are they bringing out Palladium? Because <laughs> I know it's going to get mentioned, which is not my system. We, we've we've talked multiple times what, what my favorite systems are, but I give I'm it not- respect. Like the Lord of the Rings, I give it respect for what it is. So, Jerome, we've been talking about getting you on the show for a while. And- well, I appreciate that. Thank you. That's a very nice thought. And I reached out to you about specifically the game system that we're going to talk about later, mm-hmm. and you, you proposed a list of movies that you thought would be good for it, mm-hmm. one of which I had never seen, and I'm really glad that you proposed it and that we're getting you on for this, and that movie is Ba-ba-ba-bum. Deadpool. Uh, it was yes. so good. The super movie, that the, a movie that Nathaniel said he would probably never want to do or see because it dealt with... I don't like supers. No, but Deadpool, <laughs> thankfully, is not a super. He's not yeah. a full-blown super. I also, I'll admit this, I don't like the online meme persona of Deadpool. Deadpool is basically the superhero personification of I Can Has Cheeseburger. Pretty much. And it gets a little old no, when, it never when gets your old. feed is full of Deadpool <laughs> memes and you don't read the comics or like supers. Yeah, because it's, yeah. I mean, it's a big piece of, of, of Deadpool's kind of... Uh, the theory behind Deadpool, the the character of Deadpool, is that Deadpool is the only character in the Marvel universe who understands that he's in a comic book, mm-hmm. and everybody else just thinks he's crazy. Yes, and that, and that's why he breaks the fourth wall, and he references, sometimes literally, yeah, he references himself as being a comic and being a not quite hero in this weird universe so i understand uh from the very beginning thanks to the way that certain names were put in the credits mm-hmm. that is, is he a rob liefeld character he is a rob liefeld <laughs> yes. character yes he, uh, amazingly because he has feet um, <laughs> and, um, hands. and hands and hands <laughs> mm-hmm. um and and while he has a lot of pockets yeah. he is not made entirely of pockets no. okay one of my favorite moments of this whole movie I had to pause it. I was laughing so hard when it happened. I I could not contain my laughter. Okay, was with, after he got his hand chopped off. <laughs> oh, I, I know where and you're he's going. The, back at home, and he's hanging out with the old lady, and he scratching. He's touching her face with his tiny little hand, <laughs> and I'm laughing because one, it was so funny, but two, that was definitely a life field reference. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So we well done. Th- there there is something we will mention here as we as we always kind of talk about with 
anything, any kind of movie that has been uh, transferred over from a graphic novel or from a book. We're not going to do a deep dive into the comic book or, you know, any of the history of the comics, but this is just focusing on the movie. Oh, and also there will be spoilers. Oh, yeah. You really shouldn't have to say that. You're listening to a podcast about a movie. You should probably make sure and listen to it if you've seen it. Yeah. And if you haven't seen it, just pause right now. We'll be here when you get back. Go watch it. Yeah. And then come and listen to the gloriousness that comes from our lips. Great, you're back. <laughs> hey. Yay. So this wasn't movie, that a fantastic movie? It was pretty good. <laughs> this movie actually has a lot of history to it. Uh it going back to like two thousand, um, Artisan Entertainment had announced this like deal with Marvel Entertainment to co produce and finance and distribute uh, a bunch of films based on Marvel characters, uh, including Deadpool. So by February of 2004, the writer and director at that time, David S. Goyer and Ryan Reynolds, had been working on the Deadpool film for New Line Cinema. So it's been Ryan Reynolds since the beginning. From the beginning. Okay. Actually, the Ryan Reynolds and the director, and the, ultimately who became the director, and the two screenwriters, specifically the two screenwriters, have been this little nebulous unit the entire time. And there's a little bit of other history that goes with it, like um, the production company that that gave, that greenlit everything. Ultimately, they did not want to have the screenwriters on set and paying them to be on set to help with any last second in the moment changes. Ryan Reynolds paid money out of his own pocket to have them there every single day for filming because they the but the budget for this was a paltry fifty eight million dollars for a super movie. Yeah, my understanding is, and you probably will will deep dive into this a little later, but my understanding is that Ryan Reynolds has been wanting to play Deadpool basically since he became an actor. Pretty much, yeah. And he, so it, he he was very invested in getting it right after having done it terribly for so long before. And he did give a really good credit to the writers in the opening scene, the mm-hmm. opening credits. I think it was like the true heroes, yes. the writers, <laughs> or something like that. Now, initially, they had worked on uh, Blade Trinity together. Now, Blade Trinity is it, it's a good movie because of Ryan Reynolds. Mm-hmm. That's why it's a good movie. And you can you can see proto Deadpool in Blade Trinity. I thought Blade 2 was so bad that oh. I was just I'm never going to see the same with the Matrix. I never saw oh. the third one cuz the second was so bad. Oh, God. I didn't see Blade Trinity cuz the first one or the second one was just terrible. We could probably start another podcast on just how horrible <laughs> some like just, like horrible sequels.com. That's that's all we can do is just and uh. those would be in the top few there but after doing blade trinity he was really interested and he really wanted to be invested in 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 doing this and had been reading a lot of the the deadpool comics and he he liked that one of the writers actually said that deadpool was a quoting ryan reynolds crossed with a sharpe (laughs) and that actually got lined into the movie and after hearing that he's like i have to read the comics so going back that far Yes, he's been he's been wanting to, but n- nobody nobody at the time really believed he could like champion that role and everybody but the people around him were like you know you can do it. You've got the timing, you've got the wit, you can do it. But 20th Century Fox, they were betting all their 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 gold, so to say, on the X-Men films and didn't want to put that project forward. So did it pay off? Which part? The money. Oh yeah, oh god. <laughs> oh yeah. So And we'll get to that. (laughs) Okay. I didn't take Ryan Riddle seriously as an actor Mm -hmm. until much later in his career because uh, I'm the kind of person who doesn't really like these sorts of movies very much. I'm not a big... Like, I liked Blade Trinity mostly because... I don't know. I didn't have anything better to do. (laughs) Um, I did appreciate... The highly problematic phrase "cock juggling thunder cunt." Yeah, um, was that from this movie or Blade? No, Trinity? it's from Blade Trinity. Oh, okay. Trinity. Yeah, uh, that was the that was the Ryan Reynolds moment. It was like I am never going to watch this guy in a movie ever again. <laughs> See, I cock I fell... juggling thunder cunt. Yes, yes. <laughs> he ad libs a lot. Yes, he really does. He's got this like celerity wit and and 
there's my nerd card for people that have played, nice. you know, that's you a, know, that's a good one. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, some old friends when we used to play, when we used to LARP, like, you know, uh-huh. have celerity wit. So that's, it just stuck for years, but he likes to add five dots and wit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He, he, he has that. And, and I yeah. remember, I remember watching him. The first time I saw him was two guys, a girl in a pizza shop. Uh huh. And that humor, I was just like, I, I, I wait, could. Wait, wait, wait. That was a TV show. He was on yes. that. Yeah. That was two, two guys, so a girl in a pizza. Yeah. So it was Nathan Fillion. <laughs> it's a great show. Yeah. It is. It, it was later changed. It was later, later shortened to two guys and a girl. And then it just, after I think like five seasons, it ended. Um, it's hilarious. It was really, it was one of those also ran, uh, ro- uh, like situational comedies, but Two Guys, a Girl, and a Pizza Place was a great show. Mm-hmm. Did you ever see Don't Trust the Bitch in Apartment 23? Yes. yes. Uh, is that any good? It, it was, no, is it the same level of good as that? Better, like, that more, un, that more. unexpected, like, what Better. the hell am I watching? Oh, no. Okay. Ryan, Ryan Reynolds, the things that would come out of his mouth and his physical acting during, during the show, like, you watch Blade Trinity, you watch this movie, and you're like, okay, you you you've you've had to learn, you've had to hone, you've had to craft this this wit. And you go back and you watch his early stuff, like Two Guys and a Girl, and you see that he it's just naturally there. It's always been there. It's just gotten better over time. Right on. Yeah. So what stopped Deadpool from being made were a few things. The initial director was Robert Rodriguez, which I would have loved to see Robert Rodriguez do this movie. That would have been amazing. But then he uh, he got an offer to do like Spy Kids 4, mm-hmm. and was like, yeah, I don't want to do this. Anytime you get to hang out with Danny Trejo, you take that. Well, that's true. But this was also long, way, okay. way before it actually came out. And then Adam Berg was looked into doing, doing it, but he also declined. I don't know who that is. Uh, yeah. Um, and then in <laughs> 2011, Tim Miller was approached... To he had been doing a lot of visual effects mm-hmm. uh, on X Men on the X Men films, and he made his directorial debut with Deadpool. Uh, and Ryan Reynolds had closed the deal with Fox to produce the film, but then Green Lantern happened, and Ryan Reynolds' uh, property fell off a cliff. Right? Yeah, and yeah. and the studio was like, "Nope, we're not doing Deadpool. <laughs> Fuck you, Ryan Reynolds. You're not that funny. This movie was horrible." We're not doing Deadpool. So it's sat. Which is really unfair to Ryan Reynolds. It is. He, he does absolutely everything he possibly can to make that movie watchable. Now, I, I saw Green Lantern, and I I was not, other than Batman, okay, I was not a DC fan. Mm-hmm. My, my best friend growing up was everything was Superman, and all he ever talked about was DC Comics. And I got just, it was like, mm-hmm. I don't want to deal with this. But I like Batman, and so I didn't know any of the history of Green Lantern. I actually enjoyed the movie overall. I thought it was pretty good. It had problems, but I didn't know the history, so I couldn't sit there and pick it apart. Right. So, so since that movie was a disaster, it tainted the entirety of the Deadpool project, and Fox executives were had already been concerned about having an R-rated superhero movie. Right. They're like, you know, we don't we don't really want to do this because. You sucked in in Green Lantern, and you want to make this R rating. So, yeah, so all those thirteen year olds can't sneak into the exactly, film. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So after several meetings, the studio had agreed that the film would not would could not be reconfig- reconfigured for a more traditional PG thirteen setting. They they wanted to have the kids, and they were like, "No, I don't think we can do this, but we'll give you a low six figure figure budget, like really low, uh, to produce just some test footage." Uh, that actually was what we saw that leaked footage of him up on the bridge with the car and everything. Do you remember that, Nathaniel? It's, no. It's the okay. opening. It's the opening. Well, it's not it's the, the first opening. fight. Yeah, it's, yeah. The, it's that but first, it's the first fight. big fight. Yeah. yeah, it's he's sitting atop the the overpass and he's got a draw a crayon drawing of like oh, okay. snake yeah. eyes yeah. and he's it's yeah. and Shoop is playing. And yeah. yeah, yeah. That all that whole CG thing was was test footage and it was never supposed to be seen apparently except to executives executives were like well we really don't know if this is bankable ryan reynolds to this day in interviews he says he had no i has no idea who leaked the footage <laughs> but then his eye will wink at the same time yeah the air quotes around leaked yeah. you know <laughs> and the internet got a hold of it and within like two weeks the the, the production comes were like we're making this movie we there's enough outcry for it i have to say that that scene that 
the animated footage, that test footage, mm-hmm. sold me on this on the movie. Okay. Oh, animated? Yeah. Which animator? It was a se- the, the, ver- the opening. Was, the opening sequence. No, 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 no. No, this roll is, around the vehicle. No, there, there. There's the first big fight that, yeah. that he has when he's in his suit. Yeah, and it's where he's sitting atop the bridge and he drops down into the yeah, suburban yeah, yeah. and he kicks everybody's ass. That was all just CG animated for a test, and then Ryan Reynolds just produced a voice. That was put out. That got leaked, oh, and no, then they I went back and refilmed yeah. everything you know, on a green screen, because that's how movies work these days. Yeah, all on green screens. I have to say though that I mean the choreography of that fight is astounding. Oh, it's yeah. amazing! Yeah. And I tech imagine nerd for me that was amazing. I'm sorry I interrupted. you. No, it's totally fine. I imagine that I, I imagine that previs that test that quote unquote test footage really helped with shooting that too. Fox actually was a little doubtful on the script. So they initially wanted to try and bring Deadpool in into one of the Avengers movies. They're like, hey, we've already got this set up. We can we can bring him in or do his own Avengers like team movie, which ultimately kind of became Deadpool, Deadpool 2. And even during different times of the development, James Cameron and David Finchner were both you know, up to work on this movie, but they, they just declined. They were just like, no, nah, this is a little out of what we want to do. Yeah. I can see James Cameron's Deadpool as being, yes. So what we need to do is genetically engineer a superhero <laughs> and then film it. Yes. <laughs> I have enough money. Let's just let's do it. I, I know, I know the planet it, with the Navi. We'll just go there. And yeah, I'll it's only going to take, take 13 this, years. I'll take this camera that I created yeah. that I can only film my movies on and we'll go there. It's DNA encoded to me. <laughs> <laughs> I can't film how I want to film, so I'm going to create a camera that doesn't have the technology for it out yet. Fucking wonderful. The power cord goes into my pants. <laughs> so the final budget you said was fifty. The final million? budget, yeah. The final budget was a whopping for a super film. $58 million. I, I know that there are romantic comedies that have been shot for more money than that. Actually, I think Ryan Reynolds' movie with Sandra Bullock, the romantic comedy, was probably had a higher budget than, than this movie. And I love all the gags about the budget throughout oh. the whole movie. Oh, like, yeah. To the point that every time I come over here, there's just the two of you hanging out. It's almost as if the studio couldn't afford more X-Men. <laughs> Apparently, the head of the studio, that ended up being his favorite line out of the whole movie. <laughs> Right, because studio executives never get the joke. No, they never do. So the budget was $58 million. The opening weekend was $135 million. Holy shit. The gross USA take $363 million. Worldwide gross, three quarters of a billion dollars with a B. Dude. This is one of the, this is one Dude. of those movies that I own on Blu-ray, yeah, and I don't here. own a lot of movies on Blu-ray. I tend to movies that are visually pop, mm-hmm. uh, sci-fi movies specifically, you know, The Matrix, anything, or or any of the older movies like Charade or um, uh, uh, any um, Hitchcock movies that have been redone. I'll go with those. I own exactly three movies on Blu-ray. What are they? I have a bunch of TV shows, but three movies specifically: Jet Li's Hero, good movie. Transformers the movie. <laughs> Did you and, uh, the 1986? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, 1986 right. one. And the uh, the all lady Ghostbusters movie. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah, I have that one too. Yeah. yeah. I I also own yeah. the real Ghostbusters. Yeah, yeah. No. Well, no, I also own the real Ghostbusters <laughs> <laughs> cartoon. <laughs> Because Lorenzo music, but right. I really I loved the Lady Ghostbusters movie. We'll, we'll talk about that some other day. Sure, that so was yeah. One of the guys that actually <laughs> like skipped out on this, Daniel Cudmore, who had played Colossus in in X Men Two, X mm-hmm. X Men Unlimited, and X Men Days of Future Past. He was actually asked to play Colossus. And he turned it down. He said he didn't he didn't want to do that because he knew his voice was going to be overdubbed by Andre I'm gonna I can't pronounce this. Uh Tricotu? Probably got it wrong. Probably. Yes. He was unhappy of someone overdubbing to have the heavy Russian voice. So he said, Yeah, no, I'm out. Did you just say Nyet? <laughs> no, I did not. <laughs> But, but, but that was pretty funny. Of. I thought that was, that <laughs> was, was a good joke. I thought that was a good I, joke. I would have just, just said yes. Oh, yes, okay. I did. All right. Yep. 
Sometimes I'm a little slow. I loved Colossus in this. Oh, Colossus was great. great. Yeah. He's a great anchor to <laughs> yeah, Deadpool yeah. in this movie. He's so, so prim and proper, and and everything's got it. He's he, yeah, he was great. Yeah, the thing about Colossus is Colossus is the embodiment of lawful good. Yeah. I mean, he really is. He's the guy who believes that if you just follow the rules and do the right thing, everything will work out in the end. I think yeah. he actually says that almost word for word uh-huh. in the movie. <laughs> yeah. Right? It's the it's the moment when he, he hands Negasonic Teenage Warhead my favorite character name ever. <laughs> when he hands Negasonic Teenage Warhead the protein bar before they go on the mission. Yes. <laughs> uh, the studio actually changed Negasonic Teenage Warhead I think what her name. Yes. Um, Cause in the, in the comic, I guess she has, she has telepathy and she has some other kind of superpowers, but the studio went like, yeah, but you've got supersonic nuclear warhead in the name. No, let's just make her do explosions. <laughs> <laughs> so they changed the character. They changed a lot of the character. They also changed uh, Deadpool's girlfriend because she is copycat in the, in the comics. Mm-hmm. And there's only like one or two allusions to that. When there's a part where, uh, she she makes comment about having a lot of different roles, mm-hmm. playing different roles. That's the only one of the only nods to her comic book version. Mm-hmm. And then then there's a, then there's a scene where she kind of has a blue tint to her because she has blue skin apparently at some point. I had heard that the roommate, the blind lady, was also supposed to be like a deeper character in the comics, yes. like a special agent of yes. some kind. Uh, or MI six maybe. Um, yes, that. Yes, Blind Al, uh, who played uh, Leslie Uggams had played that character, the elderly blind woman that was his yeah, roommate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, apparently, she had been brought up through the British intelligence secret service and had done all kinds of like weird, wild, and like crazy shit. And she's old and feisty. <laughs> and there was supposed to be like more of a story with her, but they haven't gotten a chance to like go into it. Not even the second movie. No, not even uh... the second movie. I mean, there's there's little hints if you know what to look for. Little little Easter eggs because there are so many Easter eggs throughout this entire movie. I mean, even in in the opening sequence alone, there's t- like twenty four breaks of the fourth wall. There's, All of the Hugh Jackman references are oh, those solid. Are great. <laughs> yeah, the other thing is right. I mean, in the opening credits, the guy who he burns with the 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 thing mm-hmm. and he dr- drops the the lighter in his mouth as he's coming out of the car during the opening credits, his wallet is open and the guy's name is Rob Liefeld. Yes. <laughs> And I and I think the uh, the pizza the the pizza <laughs> company the box that he's that that uh, Ryan Reynolds is carrying to go see the the, the kid the, mm-hmm. the stalker uh, it it it's uh, his last name his favorites yeah. or Feig's favorites something like yeah, that yeah so, like Feig's favorites yeah it's it you know a nod to the people and everyone in Marvel and there's so there's so much going on in this movie you have to watch it multiple times to catch everything. Weifeld was in the movie. Yeah. He was in the bar. <laughs> like, holy crap. <laughs> there there's so much. Like yeah. there's the 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 list of names yeah. on, on yeah. the on the you know to call, what to call Deadpool and, and one of them is like Al Capone or something like that. <laughs> and um there's there is a full list, I promise Captain you. Captain Deadpool. Yeah, yes. No, just Deadpool. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the thing that so I mean, when you think about it, right. I, I can't imagine that Ryan Reynolds managed to get this movie made without calling in every favor he ever had. Probably. The, especially when you consider the cast is a lot of sort of, I mean, not, I have no criticism of their acting abilities, but a, most of the cast is basically second tier bit players and Canadians. I right? I will agree. With, I mean, they are. And again, again, I'm not disparaging any of the actors because it was a, it was a great cast especially cuz we follow cuz we're following this up from Firefly and and we've got, you know, oh yeah, she's in it. Um and she's a, yeah, who she I was, love. She's, great she's, in this. she's amazing. I thought this movie. she the, was better in this than she was in Firefly. The, she was significantly better yeah. in this than she was in Firefly. Yeah. I think a lot of that has to do with Joss Whedon, but that's another show. Yeah. Uh, yep. That the whole yeah. every holiday bit that they did through their their first year of the relationship. Happy International Women's Day. Oh my god. <laughs> Oh, oh, no, no. <laughs> okay, I, get, I do need, who was, there was a character, there, it seemed to be a reference to something that I didn't get, because I don't follow a lot of super movies, so I guess there was something happening at the beginning when you first meet the bad guys. 
there's this uh there's this actor who always plays when hollywood needs a generic evil persian overlord villain Mm -hmm. they get this guy to fill this role and he comes off a helicopter and he meets with the the bad guy mutants and they tell him they're going to get more money and then he leaves who was that? Oh, I know who you're talking about, yeah. and I can't remember his name now, just but the, yeah. Was he a reference to the extended X-Men universe or something, or just... I believe so. I just yeah. don't know what, because okay. I'm not too embroiled in the X-Men universe. I That's not that's not my podcast. Well, hopefully someone listening can let us know. Yeah. <laughs> I think mostly he was there to establish that the bad guys were bad guys, because they were selling weapons to a brown dude who hates mutants. Okay. Well, yeah. there we go. Yep. Yep. So the movie was directed by Tim Miller. This was his debut film. Oh, really? Yes. Uh, so not not a bad film for his you know kickoff. But because of this, he has uh, well, he did work on Scott Pilgrim. Mm-hmm. Uh, he also worked on Thor: The Dark World, and then he was an art director for Mass Effect Two. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, really? Yes. yes. Okay. All right. <laughs> Good job, Tim. Uh, his Good n- job. His two movies he has in the pipeline, he is doing the uh, new Terminator movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger, mm-hmm. and then following that up with Sonic the Hedgehog. This was the fifth time for Ryan Reynolds to portray a comic book character, and we've already kind of touched on those, but if you are unsure, it was, uh, he previously played in Marvel's as Hannibal King in Blade Trinity, uh, Wade in X-Men Origins Wolverine, Hal Jordan in DC's Green Lantern, and Nick Walter in Dark Horse's R.I.P.D., which is a, which actually, the movie's not ho- horrible, horrible. Why would you ever want to watch a movie about the Rhode Island Police Department? No, it's not Rhode Island Police Department. Okay. It's Rest in Peace like department. It's oh, based off a graphic more novel. Interesting yeah, it's, than Rhode it's about it's about yeah. dead cops. Yeah, oh, okay. Jeff, Brid- Jeff yeah. Bridges is in it. He plays he plays his partner. It's it's funny, but there there are problems with it. Um, you we'll being very that kind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also, I noticed that you mentioned that he played Wade in in Wolverine Origins, yeah. uh, and not the fact that he also plays Deadpool in that movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He does a really bad job, but yes. he plays Deadpool in that movie. Oh God, that was horrible. I loved, but I loved in Deadpool. He even had the figure of uh-huh. himself. Yep, with the swords coming out of his. Mm-hmm. Have you seen X Men Wolverine? <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> all right, let's do a little. Well, no, 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 here. no. Let's talk about Deadpool. Okay. Yeah. No. Let's, let's, let's bring it back. Let's all bring right. it back. All right, all right, all right. We're all right. going off tangent a little bit too much here. All right. What else uh, you got for us? That's Leslie? actually actually I was pretty much wrapped up with that. Okay. So um, yeah, I thank you for your time. <laughs> and thank you for letting me be here tonight. <laughs> cool. Well, it's good seeing you, Dusty. Thanks thank for you, coming. I'll see you later. Bye. I'm tapping out. Bye. Oh, oh shit! <laughs> I really, I really enjoyed this film. I was not expecting to because, again, the internet ruins everything. I could not stop laughing. I could not get over the fact that I could not stop seeing goddamn memes. And this is a meme movie. This movie is nothing but meme joke, meme joke, meme joke, meme joke. Again, I can't have cheeseburger in live action. And and I think with I, murder I, and death, I, I think and titties. I think Ryan Reynolds kind of like has his finger on that pop culture pulse. And can bring can bring memes out into a movie. I mean, I think I think he's very aware of what his acting is, what his acting style is, and what this character will what it was going to bring. And what one of the things that I think the studios just completely didn't did just refuse to look at is the want for having an R rated super movie. And when they saw that, they were like holy shit, we can make a lot of money off of letting little 13-year-olds sneak in and see this, and then they can, you know, what was that phrase that from the the the, the, the cock-munching oh, thunder yeah. cunt? <laughs> Say that to cock juggling thunder yes. cunt. <laughs> That's why I'm surprised I liked it. Yeah. Uh, it, it wasn't expecting it to be as funny as it was. Yeah. I have uh, just seen too many bad superhero movies, especially w- bad X Men movies, yeah. of which most of them to me are that I've yeah. seen. I will not disagree yeah. with you about that. The, the X Men movie, the X Men franchise has been really badly served. Yep. Um, and I think uh, right when the best movie that you made is a two, that's a bad indicator of how good your movies are. I, I personally think the best X Men movie has been Logan so far. That's yeah, but old but man, I'm not own. even. I'm not even sure that old man Logan is in continuity. No, but it's not. But it's it's. <laughs> my, I, I 
So, so I really liked this. It, it was fun. I liked the jokes. I liked I liked the the complete package. There was not a moment that I disliked of this movie. What was your favorite part, Nathaniel? Like, do you have anything in there that was like your favorite part or a couple favorite parts, your favorite line, anything? The blowjob. <laughs> the blowjob. I love that whole scene. I think he and that actor had nice. Uh, I think Ryan Reynolds and the guy who played uh, the bartender, T.J. Miller. Yeah, T.J. Miller. He's, he's, he's canceled. Yeah. Um, I think the two of them had a really good, uh, really good balance on screen, and I really liked that whole the way it went down and, and Wade just sitting there like, "Yep, I did this." <laughs> do you do you have the the extended like director's cut or the where it has the outtakes where they just no they're. That whole scene where they're talking about like you look like a you know like a something they said like of avocado or, or like an avocado fuck that Freddy was so Kruger. good and the relationship was dark it was yeah. bad uh, <laughs> so they went into that scene trying to make the other one like gag or just get yeah. grossed out so they there you can go out and find like they just go on and on and on and it's hilarious that was a good one yeah yeah that was all it was all about the break for that one it was mm-hmm. all about can i make the other person break character yeah, yeah. and i so weasel mm, mm, it's hard for me to disconnect the the it's often hard for me to disconnect people who's who put in performances and the person who's doing the performance mm-hmm. and unfortunately because i don't like tj miller all that much i was not that enamored with weasel um but i do have to say that weasel does get a lot of really great lines like i'd go with you but i don't want to <laughs> yeah. so i take it you don't watch silicon valley i do not oh he's one of the reasons why i watch silicon valley yeah i uh, only know him from one other thing and that was cloverfield and he kind of made that movie good and yeah. he's also a voice in big hero six he's one of the characters oh yeah, yeah he has okay. a very distinct yeah. voice yeah what was uh, your favorite scene the scene where they go to see uh ajax the you know the bad guy in the yeah. stand and uh the um uh rosie o'donnell in leather that he calls him <laughs> is standing up there he's like she's gonna superhero jump she's gonna superhero jump wait get out of the way and then she, that whole bit three point him, landing yeah yep. that whole bit with him was hilarious yep. And uh, and then I think when when Negasonic like powers up and and he's uh, he says remind re, something about remind I forgot what he's trying to tell her but just it was hilarious that whole little bit I I have to say that my favorite scene uh, aside from the sort of big set piece fight mm-hmm. right right at the beginning where he kicks everybody's ass with twelve bullets <laughs> um, is um, I have to say that my favorite bit is when he meets. Vanessa for the first time. Their and, conversation. Oh, the back and forth. And and the fact that the thing that got me is that that like the reason I like Wade Wilson is because he respects her. He understands that she is doing a job. He is willing to pay her for her time. Yep. Mm-hmm. And he doesn't expect he he doesn't expect sex. He yeah. expects her to be a companion. And then like <laughs> right, he's like, What do I get for this? What do I get for this ring? three minutes and it's like what are we going to do for the next two minutes and 30 seconds yeah. <laughs> ski yeah. ball right yeah, mm-hmm. yeah balls and holes yeah balls, balls and holes, and holes. so but i really i, I think yeah. it, i'm sorry i didn't mean to interrupt but it's i think okay. i think it says a lot about both wade and vanessa that they both kind of recognize each other as professionals yeah, yeah. and that there's this sort of established relationship right off the bat that n- nobody needs saving which I, I I get a little ground up about because they kind of turn her into a trophy at the end of the movie. But the thing is that when I watched it again on Tuesday, what I noticed is that he doesn't really actually save her. Nope. No, and no. there was... She does a yeah. lot of saving herself in this movie. There was a, a scene in the trailer that wasn't in the movie that I really... I would really hope, since we're kind of going on that direction right now, where the bad guy turns to her and and says something along the lines of, um, you know, is your boyfriend going to save you? And she like flat out says, I don't like something like I don't need saving. And she like kicks his ass. And that was taken out of the movie for some yeah. reason. And it was in the trailer and it was too bad. But how many Deadpools do you give this movie? <laughs> How many bullets? How many bullets? Yes. How many bullets? <laughs> I give it 12 out of 12. 12 out of 12? I, think, I think it earned all 12. Uh, I, I give it 11 out of 12. Yeah. 11 out of 12? Just because they included G.J. Miller. So. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, going to go 12 out of 12 bullets. Yeah. Actually, we could should have done chimichangas because that's his, <laughs> that's really? his favorite. Yeah. The, the whole There's a big stick in the comics that his favorite food is chimichangas, and that's why later on in the movie he says it's time to make the fucking mini chimichangas. 
Yeah, it gets four fifths of a chimichanga. Yeah, four fifths. <laughs> All right, well, let's take this to the gaming table. All right. Hi, this is Matthew. Thanks for listening. We wanted to take a moment to talk to you about uh, one of our sponsors, Guardian Games. Guardian Games has been with us since the very beginning of this show. Guardian Games is Portland's premier game store. They have magic miniatures, shelves and shelves and shelves and shelves of RPGs, all the gaming swag, anything you could possibly want for your gaming experience. If you're ever in Portland and looking for a gaming store, Guardian Games is the biggest, most diverse store in Portland. You definitely owe it to yourself to go to Guardian Games. Well, taking this to the gaming table, Dusty, tell us about the player characters. Yes, so the player characters we have in this movie, we will start out with Ryan Reynolds, also known as Wade Wilson, and the aforementioned Deadpool, the star of this movie. Well, we've already talked about what the other things that he's been in. Yes. What about his alignment? Deadpool okay. is the embodiment of chaotic neutral. Yeah. But, but in a not shitty way. Yeah. Right? Yeah. No, it's he, it's all about the laugh. Yeah, he's the chaotic is. neutral player that you don't mind having at the table. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he's, he's a shit stirrer, yeah. but he's a he's a fun shit stirrer. Yeah. <laughs> I'll agree with that completely. <laughs> yep. One hundred percent. Yep. And then we move into Marina Bakarain, uh, who plays who plays Vanessa. Arguably chaotic good. I would agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, I think in this, she's definitely more of an NPC. She doesn't really, or, or either that, or she's the character, the, she's the player who missed a few sessions in the middle mm-hmm. and then showed up at the end to to enjoy something. But mm-hmm. yeah. She, uh, Morena, apparently described Vanessa as being more like scrappy and not the damsel in distress. So we talked mm-hmm. about that a little yeah. bit before the break. Uh, and she was initially designed as just the quote, typical prostitute, end quote. But she had worked with the costume and makeup teams to make her appearance more layered because she wanted to give some more depth to the character. She initially thought the character was very two dimensional, as as with typical prostitute, quote unquote. Yeah, so, anybody who said he, anybody who uses the phrase "typical prostitute" one doesn't know any sex workers. This is and true. Two yeah. doesn't understand how movies work. Yeah. This is also true. <laughs> then we have uh, Ed screen who plays francis also known as ajax the bat the big baddie in the movie yeah he's an npc yeah i NPCs yeah, he can is. have alignments he's I, chaotic he's chaotic evil chaotic yeah of course look what he look what he did to deadpool just to like oh, that, okay hold on hold on there's that's just being mean uh, I, I but his, his methods like he was running a crime syndicate wouldn't he just say maybe neutral like but then he shot himself with everything, and he was like, fuck it, I want all your powers. Bam. Okay. That's kind of Jack Sparrow chaotic. No, okay. No, so, okay, so the henchman, <laughs> um, who's, I'm, I yeah. don't remember the name of the actor, but I've seen her in a bunch of stuff. Oh, that uh, was who Gina plays, Carano, who plays Angel Dust. Yeah, yes. Angel, so, so she is neutral evil. Not lawful evil? I'd go with neutral. I would go what? with neutral, mostly because she's she's a pretty effective henchman, but uh-huh. she's not really like a right hand person. But she's also an NPC. Okay. Yes. Hmm. Okay. Most of this movie was NPCs. There are only yeah. a couple player characters in this they, movie. They, the bad guys, their intentions were also kind of vague. They were just evil. They weren't really doing much that made sense. Yeah. Well. Yeah. So I kind of take this the whole Deadpool. I mean, the, this movie. Even the game, if you if you want to look at it from both sides of the same coin, it's a revenge story told from two different points of view. A revenge story from Deadpool's point of view to Ajax and a revenge story for get, from Ajax getting back on Deadpool. That's all it is. There's really – it's layered, but it's still – that's it. And Ajax, it, is, his, whole, his whole thing is what's my name? Like that's his revenge is – his revenge is they told he told him my name. Yeah, like, I know. <laughs> I didn't say it was a well developed coin. Well, I mean, so if we want to, if we want to talk, like, I, I understand we want to do the PCs first, but when we talk about motivations, right? Mm-hmm. Ajax's whole line of work is taking people, turning them into weapons, and then selling them as weapons. Yeah. yeah. Right. And so that's not exactly the most good thing you can do. Well, in the he's world. definitely evil. Yeah. Um, but I also don't. I also don't think that he's particularly. Like, I'm not sure he's neutral or or lawful evil. Simply because I don't think he's very good at it. Like he abuses a customer, right? You don't mm. abuse your your supply chain. You don't abuse your customer. Well, well, that's, right? a, that's, I mean, a, that's a power trip. I mean, yeah, yeah. So, hmm. 
And then we have T.J. Miller. Well, hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay, I'm sorry. I thought that here's was a question. Going on. Let's go. Let's let's take this. I'm curious. Okay. G.I. Joe. All right. Destro. Mm-hmm. Alignment. Yeah. Destro is lawful, lawful evil. evil. Okay. Couldn't this guy simply be a less capable Destro? I don't think mm, you can be less capable no. and still be lawful. Yeah, I'd have to agree with that. You can be lawful, but not good at it. Like <laughs> I, I think, by, I would almost, I would almost argue that by definition, in order to be lawful evil, you have to be good at your job. Not necessarily. It, it's more of a mindset. Uh, okay. Okay. I, uh, uh, bearing in mind, of course, that I am of of your audience. I am one of the very few people who think that alignment is bullshit, and we should never talk about it ever again. Do Do I need to balance this and bring up and, and just like throw out sneakers somewhere in there and bring up that conversation? <laughs> Cosmo did nothing wrong. dot com. <laughs> Cosmo did nothing wrong. dot com. <laughs> then we have TJ Miller as Weasel, and uh, my argument there is going to be that Weasel is not a player character. No, they're a, he, G, they're a GM PC. Yeah, they're, he, they're, they're the game yeah, master character. Yeah, he's an yep. NPC. Uh, he spouts. He, yeah. he is the fixer essentially. He gives jobs. Uh huh. It spouts yeah. information. He, he's yeah. he's he's the the barkeep that you go up to in a video game saying, "Hey, I heard you need something stolen." Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. But the cool thing that Miller felt uh, why he was cast was that he was a character that looks like you know, I'm quoting here looks like his superhero power is spilling mustard on his shirt. <laughs> which I kind of thought was yeah. kind of awesome. Yeah. And uh, the producer needed to have someone that could keep up with Ryan Reynolds comically. And apparently TJ Miller can, if, if you've watched the, some of the latest scenes. And then we have another NPC, uh, Angel Dust played mm-hmm. by Gina Carano. She yeah. Was yeah. Wooden. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I want to, so I want to, build off of that comment because I think it's important to understand that it's a super it, of everything else it's a superhero movie and because it's a superhero movie everybody to one one extent or another is going to be a cardboard cutout that's just the way that superhero movies work these days so I'm not sure that you can I'm not sure that you can criticize Gina Carano for playing a character that doesn't get much screen time doesn't get many lines and doesn't have a lot of personality other than she's strong. I don't necessarily say that as a criticism of Gina. If that's more of a criticism of the character. Fair. It was Fair. a wooden character. Yeah. The character was merely there to punch Colossus. Yes. There was a yeah. lot of potential with that character. Yeah. I, I I wish they would have gone more into that character. Like, yeah. take Colossus. At least Colossus had personality and had lines and was doing stuff. Well, yeah, I but Colossus, Colossus yeah. is a PC. He is a PC. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Colossus is a PC. Since we're talking about him, that is uh, the voice of Colossus is Stefan Capic. Capis. Capisic. Capisic. We just lost Russia. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> he provides the voice for Colossus. Uh, and we all know who that is. Uh, but uh, they brought in. Uh, another person to do the the just be the guy that plays him, and then they did a a, 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 yeah. a motion capture on him because the guy that played him is only like six foot seven only, right? And then Colossus is like seven foot ten, yeah. so they they did the the the, the suit on him, everything. And he's I think a you're PC. right. Lawful good. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. he's yeah, the yeah, epitome yeah. of lawful good. Yeah. He, he is textbook straight out of the good. comic yeah. book. He he yes he is yeah. Um, then we have Brianna Hildebrand who plays Negasonic Teenage Warhead. She's a PC. That is yeah. That's a, the, okay, so Colossus and uh, Negasonic, they're the two PCs that like come in halfway through your like the whole gaming session. Like they heard they they heard from whoever's playing Deadpool that uh, they got a buddy that's playing this really cool game and they want to get in on it and then they show up and they play and they have like no idea what they're doing. One could argue that all of this takes place over one gaming session, and then half the movie is nothing but the Deadpool PC's really lengthy character backstory. Uh huh. Yes, yeah. I would agree Definitely. with that. Yes. <laughs> can see that. Yeah, I can see that. G- given given the system that we're going to talk about later, uh huh. Yes, that's exactly what it is. Um, and yeah, I think I think uh, Brianna Hildebrandt did a great job as uh, Negasonic Teenage Warhead, who is, one has the best character name ever. Yes. Um. And also, uh, I think so because we're doing alignments. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think she's probably chaotic neutral, leaning towards chaotic good. I mostly I, by <laughs> mostly by exposure, right? Yeah. She stands next to Colossus and then and and is therefore bending towards the arc of good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then she's standing there trying to. She's texting, you know, 
do something and then kills Angel Dust or yeah. knocks her out. Blows up the entire area. Oh, yeah. That was fantastic. That was, I, I want to talk, we, we have to talk about that moment because that's a great moment. <laughs> I didn't get that much of a read on her, really, that she was underutilized. She was yeah. very underutilized yeah. in the second film. She, I was a little disappointed yeah. they didn't use her as much as they could have. Mm hmm. I would have loved to have seen her on the screen more. Oh, she's got a lot of more yeah. screen time. Scream, screen time in the second movie, but yeah. she doesn't. She talks. She doesn't talk a lot in this movie, but she talks less in the second movie. And I also mm -hmm. think that it's it's again right. We're talking about a movie that's named Deadpool, so mm -hmm. we spend a lot of time with the the title character, yeah. and we don't get a, to spend a lot of time with the 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 rest of the <laughs> yeah. titular ensemble cast. Any of the characters left? Um, Blind Al, the elderly woman, but she's an NPC. NPC. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then Dopinder, who's also an NPC. I don't, who? This, the, the, the taxi cabbie, driver. The cabbie. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The I most mean, important character in the story. This, yeah. this movie is, is, is three characters and a DM. Three players and a, and a DM. That's yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. In my opinion. Yeah. Well, we don't really have Matthew here to take us on a story, but I mean, we got infinite comic books mm -hmm. i'm guessing yes. and we've got uh the internet which is full of deadpool memes and you've got a second movie so if you need to know where your story's going next you can always get inspiration from there so instead let's go ahead and start talking about the themes of this movie we already mentioned that it's a revenge piece yes so we want something that uh, you know is good for managing a revenge story and honestly revenge is such a common theme that you can really do any game for that but what Glory else Glory and gore so i thinking about the movie i think if you could sum this up if you could sum this movie up in one word i think the word would be vanity vanity okay. this movie is about wade's vanity wade's vanity prevents him from accepting help from Vanessa and the doctors. It prevents him from admitting that he is that's mortal. A, that's it a good point. It prevents him from then reconnecting with Vanessa, which puts her in danger. Mm -hmm. It prevents Ajax from recognizing that what he's doing is wrong. And Ajax's vanity about his name, Francis, is what drives him to be so unreasonable with Wade. It is a movie that is driven by vanity and the characters that are vain are the characters that fail and the characters that are not vain are the characters that su succeed. And the reason that Deadpool succeeds in the end is that he gives up on his own vanity. Did, did, did you and Matthew talk before here? Yeah. Because <laughs> Matthew goes on these existential, like little tired. No, it was very good. I'm not putting it down because yeah, that, no, no. that was awesome. It's just, Listen, yeah. I, like, Ma Matthew, I like Matthew. Matthew does, <laughs> does a lot of the similar things. I feel and, like uh, we just, that's it. All right, guys. <laughs> <laughs> We're not even going to talk about the games now. No, I, I think you're right. I, yeah. I, I think that there is a, a very large part of, of vanity in this and and i think everything that you said is is right on the right on the head well well done well said yeah i mean you know it's a it's a an hour and 40 minutes so it's not like you can actually distill it down to one word but i think there's there are key themes in every movie and in this movie i think that one of the key themes and, I, and arguably the key theme is is you know, from my perspective mm -hmm. it's vanity and and, and revenge yeah, right mine, and mine is revenge yeah and those and those moments of revenge are driven by vanity right no francis, i will agree with that completely. francis wants to kill wade not because wade is a problem not because he has a supply problem with wade not because like right he if ajax just decided you know what wade isn't worth it he could have. And that would be the end of the movie. Right? Yeah. But he can't do that. And, and his vanity made him go and get go get the girlfriend and put her in the bubble and Yep. Yeah. And and crash the helipad again. So Yes. Yes. I I will agree with that. Yeah, completely. More more so than on on my thought of it being uh more revenge, but I, I they kind of go hand in hand. I think yes. they, they have to have hold yes. hands at least. Well, one is inspiring the other. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. I completely agree. That's a solid assessment. I'm not, I, I didn't really think too deeply into that, but you're right. It's, it's essentially one character trait pushing the conflict and on each side. Yeah. yeah, and I and I mean, you know, uh, and I think it's and so right. We get this experience of we can talk about it, talk about it or not talk about it as we want. But right, Deadpool two then right. Deadpool two is about growth. 
um, both good kinds and bad kinds of growth mm-hmm. and how and 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 how to deal with that growth and how to c- kind of come to terms with the experience of growing and changing and, and all of that. But at the same time, if we're going to go into if we're going to continue into Deadpool two uh, vanity also, because the whole ending sequence where he, you know, goes through and yes. Yeah. So, but no, I, again, will agree with you on that as well. Yeah. I'm not sure. I'm not sure Deadpool because Deadpool is such a character that is designed to break the fourth wall, right? Deadpool's whole thing is you have to look at me, but you can't see me. Right. Um, and so he's always joking. He's always breaking the fourth wall. He's always making these big pronouncements he's always doing the big thing um i don't think he can ever move beyond that it's all he's he, his character is always going to be wrapped up in vanity yeah. one way or another well deadpool is, is is deadpool is your friend that you've known for your whole life mm-hmm. but he's that friend that as much as you love him and and he's always around or or, or she whoever you want to play that um you can only take small doses of that friend and that friend is always fucking annoying, but they're still your friend. They're still always there. What about the concept of Deadpool as the unreliable narrator? And oh, I totally get on board with that. The idea being that a good third to half of what you've seen didn't even happen kind of concept. And they slightly hint on his imagination when he is laying on the ground, looking at Marina Baccarin at the end, and those little animated creatures start appearing, <laughs> and you start thinking, wait a second. Well, the reason that happens is because he's just been stabbed in the brain. Well, yeah. well yes, but... I see where you're going with that. the first moment, you see something through his, his eyes. Like, you are given the vision of what he is seeing right now, and there's little animated creatures, and you you kind of start to question. Hmm. Yeah, I I think I, I it's tricky. I, I have so my big problem with the concept of the unreliable narrator is that there are all the, that all narrators are in fact unreliable, and so right if you have a point of view that involves any particular character, what you're getting is their point of view, and whether or not that's the irrefutable truth of the situation can be argued or not. Uh, I think that's true of um, I, I especially think that's true of any movie that includes voiceover because right any movie that includes voiceover means that you are getting a story being told to you by someone and that means that you have to recognize that it's a story being yeah, told yeah. Uh, yeah. over and above the the I, the concept of the narrative right exactly uh, but I I don't think I don't know. My experience with Wade Wilson, the character, is not that he exaggerates. My experience of Wade Wilson, the character, is that, if anything, he underplays the moment uh, because it's funnier. Um, And so my thing would be, no, it probably happened. Whether or not he was in the middle of it is another question. But it probably happened to somebody. Well, let's figure out what games that we can use for this. Yes. And really, ultimately, Jerome brought you here to talk about one game. <laughs> and I don't actually want to waste any time talking about others. Because I know we've talked about supers before, but I don't really think this needs a super system. I don't think we need something, you know, that is a superhero game. So, we don't need fucking Heroes Unlimited. We don't. So what? we're only bringing in one game. There's like the automatic winner right then and there. Pretty much. Sweet. Cool. Yep. Awesome. I'll just I'll just put my Mutants and Masterminds books away. Then. <laughs> I love that game system. Yeah. It's Mutants and Masterminds. I, I don't see Deadpool. No. The story that I experienced could be told. I think in many systems, and I don't think it necessarily needs a superhero role playing game. I, like I you agree. don't need yeah. champions no. for Deadpool. Uh, d- you this would be fine in D, 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 modern yeah. D twenty. Here's here's my problem with mutants and masterminds, which is the problem that I have with all F twenty games, okay. all games that are, d- are designed to roll a D twenty mm-hmm. for the for their methodology okay. of, respo- of of res- resolution, which is that I hate flat die curves. Okay. Um, and so any situation where you have a resolution process where there's a 5% chance of utter failure no matter what, mm-hmm. it's just I'm not interested in that kind of game system, okay. which is why I like Fate so much. Ba-ba-ba-bum. That being the game that we've been talking about a lot, and Jerome, you are the person I know who can probably sell it to us the best. I, Fair I, enough. I think after 36 episodes, Something we like that. finally have Fate <laughs> on the game. We've talked about it. We've 
it's been it's been you know spotlighted as good. It's been made fun of in some areas, but it's the first time we've actually had fate here. Yeah, absolutely. And I I think it's important to recognize right that there are a lot of people who who like fate because as I said um off mic they see what it does and immediately think that's exactly what I want to do mm-hmm. with the game. And there are a lot of people who don't like fate because they see what it does and think, yeah, I don't want that anywhere near my table. Because the thing about the fate especially so the fate core system is a, is is a moderately crunchy system it has a skill tree it has uh, a damage track it has you know all of those things uh, but it doesn't it's not nearly as crunchy as say dungeons and dragons i want to rewind this a second you you just described it as moderately crunchy now i know that many people online on the various forums who Mm -hmm. probably haven't read it as much and have only heard stories would say that it is super light Tell me more. So I think I think Fate Core System, the Fate Core System, which is different from, say, Fate Accelerated Edition, which is the version that I really like. I would say that Fate Core System is probably about as crunchy as Savage Worlds. Okay. Um, in that there's a clear there's a clear skill tree. There's a clear progression of uh, of power and capability. There's a clear uh, method of character generation and progression uh, of play. And there's a very understandable, uh, there are very understandable hooks for a person to get their fingers into. So does Fate Core, much like Savage Worlds and a lot of the games, follow the standard, the the three-step structure of character being the core, the stats, the experience, the extensions, the skills, and then the the widgets, like the feats and talents and whatever that sort of edges that build on that? I would argue that it has those three things, but it has them backwards. So technically, fate doesn't have stats. Okay. Uh, technically, what fate has are um, you get a set of skills and then you get what are known as aspects. So aspects are effectively stunts that you can do. Um, they are the things that drive your character. Um, so when, so in the process of designing a character in fate, what you do is you come up with a concept, a core concept, which is that it's literally called the high concept in fate. Okay. And so you get, uh, 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 Deadpool, the, the, the man who can't be killed, right? Or you get literally, I would write on the character sheet, Negasonic Teenage Warhead. Okay. Right. Which... That's a fantastic aspect because you're not really sure what it means. It just sounds really fucking cool. Here's a list of aspects from an example character in the book. A mostly loyal crew. Remorse is for the weak. A harem of thugs. (laughs) I've got the law in my pocket. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah. So, right, when you talk about, right, when D&D, you would have, you would set your stats and then you would figure out, okay, this is the class I want to play. And that means that these are the skills that I can use. And that gives me access to the feats that I can use. Um, <laughs> sorry, I just had to smell the book. <laughs> totally fine. <laughs> um, you'll notice that that book is autographed. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, I, yeah, yeah. Um, I noticed it too. The way that fate works is you come up with a core idea for a character and then you think, okay, so the core idea of the character is this, it's whatever it's the high concept is. And then you give them a trouble. And that trouble is a hook that you can give to the other players at the table, including the story runner, which allows the narrative to be driven forward. So like Wade Wilson's trouble is can't manage to keep his fucking mouth shut. Negasonic Teenage Warhead is... Uh, uh, angsty teenage mutant, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Colossus's <laughs> trouble is, I have to do good no matter what. Right? Lawful good. Yeah, yeah basically. <laughs> yeah, that would be a great trouble yeah, for Colossus. Yeah. Because the thing about the trouble is that it's not just a thing that you give to the GM to have them push your character. You can also use your own trouble to move the story forward. Oh, uh-huh, okay. Right? So the way that aspects work is that aspects give you a bonus to any given role. And if you play fate, I don't want to say correctly, if you play fate the way that I play it at my table, which is mostly rules as written, then the idea is that you want to give other players the ability to use you to drive the narrative forward. Okay, I can see that. Um, I like that. Then what happens is you have your core aspect, you have your you, you have your high concept, you have your trouble, and then you think, okay, 
what does this character need to survive? What are they good at and what are they not so good at? And then you have a list of skills in Fate Core. You have a list of skills and you give a certain number of points to each of those skills. So you'll have like a plus four to uh, driving and punching and you'll have a plus three to flying and what investigation okay. and blah, blah, blah. Right. There's a list of, of skills that I that I could look up in the book, but I don't want to bother. <laughs> I don't want to be bothered. But. And then once you have those, you think, okay, now that I have my main aspects and I have my skills and I know what this character kind of looks like, the, the, the established way to do it is that you're sitting at the table with everybody else and you tell a story. The first se- session is you tell a story about how you met the other characters at the table. Okay. And that's how you get the other aspects that you use to move the narrative forward. Right. So with Colossus and Negasonic Teenage Warhead and Deadpool, Deadpool has an aspect that's like uh, Colossus is my big brother who, you know, uh, Colossus is my big brother, quote unquote, big brother. Right. Or uh, it could be something like these guys won't leave me alone. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> right. Okay. Or or, um, or Colossus could have a, yeah. a, a, a an aspect that says uh, I can't help. I can't help but help Wade. Yeah. Right. Uh uh, and um, and Negasonic Teenage Warhead could say, right, her aspect after this first session of play, which is the first movie, right, she could have an aspect that's just like, Wade's cool. <laughs> right. So you have these you have these aspects which allow you to add points to any given dice roll if you can convince the GM that it's appropriate for you to use that aspect at the moment. OK. And that's about driving the narrative forward. Right. In D&D, it's all about. Well, okay, I take that back. It's not all about it. the experience that I have had playing D anD D. Is that it's very much about what's on your character sheet, what's happening on the grid in front of you, and what's happening in the GM's notes. Right. That's, that is certainly a way to play. That, that is that's a, a way. way yeah. yeah, and that is that is a significant amount of my yeah. experience of D anD D. It's one of the reasons why I don't like D anD D much. Uh, it's understandable. Um, the the core value of fate is the narrative. It's not about any given individual story. It's about the group narrative and driving that narrative towards some conclusion, whatever that conclusion might be. That that, that to me that sounds similar to um, I think we Feng Shui that we that we did where you just describe everything and that you got to have is, yeah, what pushes yeah. that narrative along. Different dice system, but this yeah. is sounding a lot system, like Feng Shui. It kind of sounds mm-hmm. real similar. So and yeah. It does. It takes a bunch of like so. Right, feng shui was uh, um, uh, Robin Law's yep. feng shui. Right, is certainly it's 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 referenced in the core rule book as an inspiration oh, for okay, the way cool. that fate is played, or at least the way that I play fate. Uh, so, speaking of different dice systems, fate has different dice. Yes. So fate uses what's traditionally known as the fudge dice system. Fudge is an open gaming license game that was written back in the early 90s, I think. Um, and so what it does it's is huge. it uses... Yeah. yeah. And it uses a D6 die, which has on its sides two opposing pluses, two opposing minuses, and two opposing blanks on every die. Okay. I saw that in the book. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> and those are fate or fudge dice. And then in any given situation, you take four of those dice and roll them. And then you add up... The pluses and minuses and blanks. I, I, I and was yeah. looking at that and I was wondering what that was because it was it was talking about that you get uh, you like either lose two points or you gain two points uh, depending on the roll. Yeah, if you had a, a minus minus plus plus, you don't gain anything. Think of it like this: your character's stats in it represent their baseline ability to actually be good at anything. Okay, no, I get it that. It doesn't okay. represent their potential. It represents the the expectation. Okay. And the dice represent the variation in that. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And the other thing is that as written, especially if you take some of the appendices at the table the way that I play it, unless it is narratively appropriate, there is no such thing as failure in the in the Fate game, especially when it comes to Fate Accelerated Edition, which is the, way, the game that I like to play. Even if you rolled like a minus four, what that means is either you don't accomplish what you want or... The cost to accomplish what you want is significant, and you determine with the rest of the players at the table what you're willing to pay to get the result that you want. I like that. 
Yeah. And also, right, so you roll your dice and you're like, oh, shit, I just rolled a minus four, right? I rolled a minus, 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 minus. So I rolled a minus four on this roll. Well, I was using my driving technique. My driving is only my a plus two. So now I'm in a plus, plus I'm in a minus, minus two. two right? yeah. Okay, so my aspect as the world's greatest pilot, I can, I can, since I'm piloting something, I can add my aspect as the world's greatest pilot and it gives me a plus one. Okay. And then if I have another aspect that makes sense to add into that role, I can spend that aspect too, right? And it's just a question of what do I invoke to get to the result that I am willing to pay for? Because I don't get anything in fate. You don't get anything for free. You have to roll like a six or better to get a success with style, which means there's no cost to your success. Hmm. Um, Everything before that point will cost you something, either narratively or in the in the realm of fate points, which is you get a certain number of chips or dots or whatever, okay. which are called fate points. And the fate points are how you uh, – that's how you get what you want. You spend the fate points in order to act on whatever you're looking to act on, which includes invoking – aspects that aren't yours the closest thing that you might be familiar with from games that i know that we've played together mm-hmm. with savage world has bennies yeah kind of give you a bonus and things yeah they, they, there's that that's why i was equating that to in my head tokens that let you do stuff okay essentially yeah. awesome right because if you're at the table and you're using and and you're using fate points often what will happen is that the the, the story runner will say i here is what I would like to do, right? I want the story to go in this direction. So I think your trouble, which is you can't keep your mouth shut, (laughs) is going to get you in trouble with this cop. And I have a fate point here. Mm -hmm. And I will give you this fate point Mm -hmm. if you let me determine what the narrative role, what the narrative direction of this, of this story is. And the thing is, you can accept the fate point that invokes your trouble. And now you get to describe, oh, shit, well, this is the GM gets to describe. Gotcha. This is what happens, right? Or if you're the player, you can say, I refuse that fate point and I'm spending a token to not let you invoke that. And I control the camera. So this is what I say happens. Okay. The other thing is that unless you are opposed in whatever you want to do, there is no reason to roll the dice. There is no situation where I go into a uh, I go into a room and I think I'm going to search the walls and roll a search skill. Okay, that's not how fate works. Instead, what you do is you say there is a secret door in that wall over there, mm-hmm. and I am willing to spend this fate point to make that happen. So you had mentioned when I first talked to you about coming onto our show that you thought Deadpool was specifically perfect for fate. What about Deadpool? This movie do you find fits fate the best so i would argue that it it doesn't it's not so much fate as fate accelerated edition so i want to talk a little bit about fate acceleration edition accelerated edition because while it shares the same name it's not the same system okay it uses the same dice resolution mechanic and it uses aspects but instead of having a skill set what fate accelerated edition has is a series of uh, i can't approaches that's what they're called so what what fate accelerated edition is is it it says instead of skills what you have are approaches so instead of a list of 18 skills you have six approaches okay they are careful clever flashy forceful quick and sneaky those are the six approaches that you have and that's all you have are those six approaches and when you're in the character creation process you say my character is big and strong, so I'm going to put a bunch of points in forceful. I'm going to put four points in forceful. I'm going to put three points in careful and clever. I'm going to put uh, two points in quick, and I'm going to put no points in flashy. So my okay. character is never flashy. He's really forceful. And so in a situation where you're resolving something, you say, I'm going to forcefully open this door. Or I'm going to forcefully op- uh, argue with this police officer. Okay, all right. Or I'm going to that works forcefully investigate this room. Okay. I think that Deadpool works particularly well for Fate Accelerated Edition because the thing about Deadpool is that it's a superhero movie, and by definition, that means that almost all of the characters are effectively two dimensional. They are a collection of aspects and powers, and so. The, we get some superhero movies do a really good job of turning those superheroes into real characters. Mm-hmm. Arguably, the Captain America movies are the best at that. 
But most movies don't bother with the character. It's about plot and it's about big action sequences. And so you get characters that are relatively simple and relatively easily defined. And that works best in Fate Accelerated Edition. You start with characters that are relatively simple, relatively easy to define, and then through play, you get to define what makes your character a human being and something interesting. Of those six, what's Deadpool? Oh, Deadpool is flashy. Forceful, too. And yeah, clever. Yeah. I mean, I, I would argue, like, in the, he's 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 a four in flashy, a three in, in clever, and a two in careful. Um, I think Quick would throw in there. I don't know. He's, he murders everything that's in his way, though. Yes. I definitely wouldn't say careful. <laughs> no, no. Uh-uh. No, yeah. He's, he's clever. I don't think he's stealthy, either. No, no he's he's, not he sneaky. doesn't have anything in sneaking. No. Yeah. <laughs> I can't shut up long enough. <laughs> right, and that's the thing, right? It's like we already know from his aspect as the the character who can't be killed. He's basically invoking that all the time, yeah. right? To not take damage, to not take stress, uh, to not uh, you know, to not take any consequences, and all of the consequences that you take. Okay, so that's the other thing that fate does is that instead of having hit points and armor class and all of that, what you have is you have opposed roles. And then once you determine who wins the role, you determine by whatever's left over, that's the amount of consequences that you take. And that can be stress. It can be physical damage. It can be a uh, cost that you'll pay later. But those are marked as explicitly on the character sheet consequences. And you can trade off stress for things like, okay, so I would have taken four stress in this attack but instead, what I'm going to say is, for the next scene, I don't have a hand. <laughs> okay. Okay. Right? That's good. That yeah, works. That works. And for Deadpool's character, that's a minor consequence. For you and me, it would be a major mm-hmm. consequence, which, which, which would take a significant amount of work to get rid of that particular consequence. But for Deadpool's character, yeah. it's a minor consequence. Yeah. He just, like, hopped it off while Colossus had him up the holding. He was just like, okay, fuck this, and chopped yeah. it off. Another example would be that first fight that he had with... Francis, Mm -hmm. where it's like the consequence is I've got a pole shoved in me and I can't get off of it. Mm -hmm. And and the thing, the interesting thing about that narrative story is that you can tell that story in fate, right? That's a that's a fight where it's clear that your character is going to lose. You can't end that fight any other way. If you do, there's no more big bad. So you're in a you're in a conversation with the story runner about what's happening in that moment and you recognize that it's narratively appropriate for your character to fail. Mm -hmm. And so the the story runner says, "Okay, I'll give you a fate point for that. Right. I get a fate point. I have a stunt, which is I, I have my aspect, which is I can't be killed. But that doesn't mean that I'm invincible. So, right, the guy stabs it, bends the end over. And the consequence is that my friend the person that I have established a bond with dies in the fire. Wasn't that him in the... Uh, no, that was a different guy. That's different from, guy? That's from Wade's time in Iraq because they talk about the... Oh, okay. The, the, I thought the that PGI was the Fridays. same guy. Yeah. Uh, okay. All right, never mind. Right. And yeah. so there's yeah. right, there's an okay. emotional consequence mm-hmm. to that fight. Does that make sense? No, that yeah, does. No, that, that makes totally total sense. Makes sense. Ah, I totally missed that mo- misread that moment in the movie. I, I literally <laughs> thought it was the same guy. I was like, well, oh, I mean, yeah, they yeah. are both white guys, yeah. so it's not exactly difficult well, to that make that also, mistake. He, I don't know. I figured he might have been dragged off and he employed him or whatever. But, you know, thinking about it, no, he wouldn't have survived that fire. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, the thing the, I like Fate, especially Fate Accelerated Edition, because there are consequences to every action. Unless it's narratively appropriate. And unless there's a reason to, nobody rolls and nobody fails. What happens is we determine how the story moves forward best together. And I realize that, like, there are even players that I play with who are like, yeah, I can't play that game. There isn't, there isn't anything I can sink my teeth into. There's no hook that I can grab onto that makes, me, makes it interesting for me to do that, for, for me to play that game. And I totally get it. But as somebody who is... As somebody who is driven more to telling a story together than to rolling a bunch of dice and doing a bunch of combat and and, and all of that, this game is effectively exactly in my wheelhouse, right? The Another movie that we talked about to do this system with was Hurt Locker, 
right? Which Ooh, is yeah. which is a movie that's all about emotional yeah. consequences. It's all about driving that narrative forward, and it has absolutely nothing to do with punching people or blowing shit up, right? No, and you can play that game, right? There's an there's an expansion for Fate, which is like Fate Worlds, which is just a series of of systems of sort of background systems that you can play games in. And one of them is you all play firefighters, not like super powered firefighters. I mean, you play first responders. Aye. Interesting. Because it's about driving the narrative and creating that emotional tension at the table together and it, telling an interesting story. I think it would work. You've, you've pitched a good, yeah, he'd done a, a good really good pitch. Here. And I thank you for telling us more about it. I, I think that we have been doing a disservice to our listeners because we constantly talk about some of the big games, but Faith's the one that we just haven't been geared up to talk about. And and yeah. this was perfect, and you gave a very, very good, yeah. stout, robust presentation <laughs> on it, so thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah I'm I, glad you're here. I think we've mentioned it before as a strong runner-up in a game called Spirit of the Century mm-hmm. for possibly The Mummy, I think it yeah, was. Yeah, it was for The yes. Mummy. Yeah, and Spirit of the Century is is was my first encounter with Fate, and I actually enjoyed it a little bit, but I think it was more that I enjoyed people that I was playing with and less the system. Mm-hmm. I would give Deadpool a run on this. All I right. definitely would. Yeah, awesome. I'd play it with I'm, the system. Yeah, I'm happy to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, See, I yeah. haven't been wrong all this time. <laughs> <laughs> it just it took 36 episodes. Right. <laughs> well, that was Deadpool. And Deadpool, we yes. brought in Jerome here to tell us about fate. And honestly, I, I think you're right. It sounds like a solid system for the Deadpool experience. And uh, one day, Jerome, maybe you should run it for us. Yeah. Well, see what I can do. <laughs> Works for me. Well, anyway, you've been listening to Half Movies Will Game, uh, recorded here in Portland, Oregon. Check us out online. We have presences on the Facebook, the Twitter. All of them. We, yeah, we got a Discord server. We got a website. Drop us a line. Say hello. Join our community. And if you feel like it, pitch us a few bucks on our Patreon and get some of that sweet bonus content. We recorded a significantly long amount of time tonight, so <laughs> yes. I'm going to be releasing some B-sides on there of our extended conversations, some both somber and entertaining. Yeah. yeah. There'll be some some interesting tangents there. Yeah. It's good stuff. Yeah. Well, once again, uh, there's no Matthew. And I'm Dusty. And I'm Nathaniel. And I'm Jerome. Thanks again for joining us, Jerome. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll see you guys next time. Thanks for listening to another episode of our show. We're still pretty new to the scene, and we'd love to get your feedback. If you like what you hear, please leave us a review on iTunes with your thoughts. Good or bad, they really help us get the word out. If you want to say hello, drop us a line on all of the usual social media sites. You can find the links right there in the show notes. You can also leave us a comment on our website at havemovieswillgame.com. We look forward to hearing from you. Half Movies Will Game is a Breakfast Puppies podcast production, and our episodes are distributed under CC BYND 4.0 license. Our opening theme is Rock and Gravel by Sid Valentine's Patent Leather Kids, with introductory narration provided by Isaac Scher. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time.